Did James say that demons believe the gospel? Hi, I'm Bob Wilkin with Grace Evangelical Society, and I have some good news for you today. Many people distinguish between what they call demon faith and what they call saving faith, and they often go to James 2.19 to say, look, the demons really believe that God is one, and they may go so far as to say the demons really believe in Jesus, but they're not saved because their faith is substandard. Well, is that true? I'd like to look at a couple of clips here at the beginning uh, from well-intentioned people. One of them uh, is a layperson. The other is a uh, pastor with a doctorate who teaches at a uni Baptist University and a Wesleyan seminary. So, Brian, if you would play the uh, first clip for us. I was in church this morning and was so convicted by this passage that the pastor read in James. It says, you believe that there is one God, you do well. The demons also believe and tremble. The passage reminded me that it's one thing to believe in God. Even the demons believe in God. Even Satan believes in God. But it's another thing to know him. Christianity is about knowing God, about having a relationship with God, not just believing in him. Now, this young woman has just come out of church. She's evidently burdened about James 2.19. And in that 30-second clip, she wants to share with us that believing in God is not enough. We must also know Him. And by that, of course, she means there must be some sort of uh, walking with God and, and obedience to God. Well, of course, first of all, there's no promise in Scripture that if we believe in God the Father, we have eternal life. Uh, the Lord Jesus said that whoever believed in Him will not perish but has everlasting life, John 3.16. The Apostle Paul said in Acts, 13, Acts chapter uh, 16 and verse 31, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. So it's faith specifically in Jesus. But her point is that that's not enough. You've got to add this knowledge of Him. Brian, if you would play clip Two from Dr. O'Neill, who's talking about demon faith. And this is where we begin to figure out what James is at, what he's after. James wants the church to realize that the devils are orthodox. The devils believe all the true things about God, the Trinity, Jesus, the incarnation, the atonement, the resurrection, the Holy Spirit, all of it. The devils believe it. Satan himself knows without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. The devil believes in one God, the Father Almighty, and Jesus Christ, his only Son. The devil believes in the Holy Spirit. The difference is that belief doesn't transform him. That creed doesn't change behavior, action, or life. That's the difference for James. He wants us to learn that belief and faith isn't just something that happens in our head where I stand up and say the creed. Right? If I say it and it doesn't change me, it's not real. And James says, you want to know what the word for that is? <laughs> Demon faith. For James, there's only two options, authentic faith or demon faith. Now, Dr. O'Neill is also very well-intentioned, and he, too, says that believing uh, is not enough. He goes on to say that you must have a changed life. He said that the problem with the belief of the devil and demons is, quote, it does not transform them. It does not change behavior, actions, or life, unquote. And then he concludes by saying, quote, belief and faith isn't just something that happens in our heads. If it doesn't change me, it is not real. The word for that is demon faith, unquote.
So you can see that what uh, Dr. O'Neill is saying is it takes more than head faith or some kind of intellectual belief, some sort of conviction, some sort of being convinced or persuaded. You've got to have actions that follow, at behavior. Well, I've got five points in response. Number one, James 2.19 says the demons believe in monotheism. You can take it to the bank, that's true. Number two, Mark uh, chapter 1, verse 24, Luke 4.34, and Matthew 8.29 all tell us that the demons believe in the deity of Christ. They believe he's the Son of God, the Holy One of God. Number three, Luke 8, 12 tells us that Satan is convinced, that is, he believes that any living human being who believes in Jesus is saved once and for all. In Luke 8, 12, in the parable of the four soils, the Lord Jesus says, Satan snatches away the seed lest they should believe and be saved. So Satan believes in the eternal security of the believer, the living human being that believes in Jesus. Number four, demons must believe that as well. After all, they are minions who serve Satan. And if Satan is active in snatching away the seed, lest they should believe and be saved, he can't do that for everybody. He's got to send out fallen angels and demons. And during the ministry of Jesus and the apostles, he used uh, demons to do just that. Point five is that all faith in the Bible is faith. There is no such thing as some sort of faith in the Bible that's other than being convinced or persuaded. My final point is this. Most people don't believe John 3.16. John 3.16 is real clear. The Lord Jesus said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but has everlasting life. The guarantee is if we believe in Jesus, we'll never perish, but right now we have everlasting life that can never be lost. Most people don't believe that. Most people are convinced that that would not be fair. And so in their view, what Jesus must have meant is, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever truly believes in him should not perish but has everlasting life. And then they think that what Jesus meant by truly believing is belief that involves a change of action, a change of behavior, that involves turning from my sins, committing my life to obey the Lord Jesus Christ my whole life, and then persevering uh, in that commitment, persevering in that obedience. Many people say that true saving faith is not only understanding and accepting what Jesus said, but it is also a volitional response to what Jesus said. And that willful response is that I'm committing myself to follow him for the rest of my life. Here's my challenge for you today. If you believe that it takes more than believing in Jesus to have everlasting life, that is, more than simply believing in him, you've got to somehow have really big faith. You've got to have commitment and obedience and perseverance. If you think that, then I would like to challenge you to pray about it. Pray and ask God, is it possible my view of the gospel is wrong? If you lack assurance of your eternal destiny, which you surely do if you look in part to your works for your salvation, then why not pray about it? And why not read the Gospel of John where the Lord Jesus lays out the saving message over and over again? And as you read, pray, Lord, please show me, is it sim really as simple as simply believing in Jesus Christ for the promise of everlasting life.
I have a couple other videos on James 2.19 that I've done over the past few years, and you can check those out as well if you like. And we have a number of articles on James 2.19 and James 2.14 through 26 at faithalone.org. If you like what you heard today, please give it a thumbs up. And remember, keep grace in focus.